So off I go to talk about uh, Apache Tika 2.0. The title of the talk was We Mean It This Time, uh, and we did, um, but we did release at least a 2.0 beta, and I'll talk about that shortly. All right, so uh, uh, Tika is an overall project uh, that deals with uh, file processing. Uh, it's a framework uh, for file type detection and then uh, extraction of text and metadata. You send it bytes, you get back uh, normalized uh, output across all of those different file formats. Um, one of the things that got me into Tika or several of the things, it's easy to add new file types for detection. It's easy to add new parsers, works recursively with embedded files, which was really important for a lot of complex file types. And it has a nice integration with uh, Tesseract OCR. Um, this is an example of uh, files that can be embedded within files, uh, and I have seen this in the wild. Uh, people do crazy things, uh, and it's important to have, be able to have parsers that can understand these file formats and then be able to process all of the different files uh, that can be stuck inside of other files uh, recursively. All right, so that's kind of a quick overview of Tika uh, for those who aren't familiar with it. Uh, so the outline of the talk, I'll start with a status of where we are on Tika. Uh, I'll talk about breaking changes in 2.0. I'll talk about uh, Maven modularization, a bit of motivations for why we added the Tika pipes module, and then I'll talk go in great detail about uh, Tika pipes. So off we go. So status, we released uh, 2.0.0 alpha uh, January. Uh, beta came out uh, towards the end of May. We were thinking about getting a 2.0 out by the conference, but that didn't happen. All good. Progress is being made, and we want to make sure that everything is working well. Um, the other ma major uh, part of the project is we recently added uh, Nicholas DePiazza, De Piazza uh, as a committer and PMC member. Uh, Nicholas and I quite a bit on the uh, Tika Pipes module, and I'd like to thank him now publicly uh, for all of his uh, collaboration on that and for his many contributions to Apache Tika. All right, so Tika 2.0, um, breaking changes at a high level. Uh, one is that if you have Tesseract installed, uh, the PDF parser will call Tesseract uh, in auto mode um, by default. So that means that if it doesn't find enough text on a page uh, or if it finds bad text on a page, uh, it will run Tesseract, which will be surprising uh, from a performance standpoint. Uh, all of the parsers have now been Maven modularized and moved around. Uh, these are not Jigsaw modularized yet, but they are at least Maven modularized. Uh, and I'll talk about that in some detail in the next slides. Uh, Tika server operates in spawn child mode, and I'll talk about that in some slides. And the metadata has been streamlined with a preference for uh, standards like Dublin Core and so on. Okay, so Maven modularize all the things. So <laughs> Tika 1.x has a massive directory with all of the different parsers, all of the unit tests, or um, all of the test documents are in one directory. Uh, it was getting unwieldy. So we decided to break the parsers uh, into three sub-modules. Uh, Tika parsers standard, uh, which are the uh, Java only, uh, fairly lightweight uh, parsers, um, are in the Tika parser standard module. Tika parsers extended are for those parsers which probably aren't used by a lot of people necessarily, but they may require heavy dependencies, um, external network calls to call uh, external resources, or they might require native libs like SQLite 3. And then the third module is Tika parsers advanced, and that is for super heavy dependencies like DL4J uh, or other heavy duty processing um, like text uh, from bytes, image recognition, NLP, that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the breakdown of the three submodules, the new three submodules of Tika parsers. Uh, we did integrate Tesseract OCR back in, up in uh, Tika parsers standard because that um, just feels like it's such a fundamental thing uh, to have available. And we're not shipping uh, Tika with Tesseract. Users have to install it or at least pull it in uh, with Tika server uh, and Docker. Uh, so it's it's not something that um, we're shipping uh, with, with it, which is why we're in, uh, incorporating it into Tika parser standard. All right, so all of those, so we've then subdivided um, even further in, into submodules for the different file types. Uh, you can see Tika parsers, so that's Tika parsers classic, or standard, excuse me, on the left. Um, Tika parsers uh, extended on the right with a scientific module. Advanced, we have the uh, deep learning. Um, we have captioning, uh, uh, object recognition, and a number of other things in advanced. We also now have, thanks to Lewis McGibney and team, a, uh, a uh, integration uh, for uh, speech to text uh, or automatic speech recognition, uh, which uh, reaches out to uh, Amazon's um, uh, ASR uh, uh, platform. Okay, so we the the key difference 
the key surprise for some folks will be that we are now only including Tika Parser standard in Tika app and also in uh, Tika server. So that if you want those extended uh, sub modules for scientific format parsing or the uh, SQLite 3, you'll need to add those. But that makes for a lighter Tika app, a lighter Tika server, fewer dependencies, no network calls, no HTTP client, none of that in Tika Parser standard. Um, we've modularized Tika server uh, in, in, in the same way. Um, so see, Tika server core um, is just the server with absolute with no parsers. But then we also have the Tika server standard, which has the standard parsers in it. And again, users will have to add the sub modules for scientific format parsing or SQLite 3. We've modularized language detection. So you only have to use one language detection, detection module. You don't have to pull all of them in and then pick only a, a small portion of that code. We've done the same with Tika Server. So we have Tika Server Core, Tika Server Classic, and we're starting to build out some uh, Tika Server Client. We've modularized Tika Eval. And let me take a short break on this. Um, so now you can drop the Tika Eval Core jar in your class path for Tika Server, and you will automatically get Tika Eval stats run on your files. This is useful when you want to do automatic detection of garbled text. Um, uh, the column on the left, Tika 114, was the text that we pulled out of a file uh, with Tika 114, uh, language ID Chinese. There were zero common Chinese words in that. Um, and the top tokens, if anybody can reach it, for, for those who can read Chinese is all garbage. The Tika 115, slight change in encoding detection, we're now pulling out German um, with much better uh, OOV or out of vocabulary rate. So these are some statistics that are available in Tika eval. You can get those now easily in Tika server simply by dropping uh, the Tika eval core jar in your class path. And you can use this in action uh, or in production um, in one particular file. The text that was stored in the PDF came out as the top. Um, the out of vocabulary on that is, you know, 100% probably. Uh, and then based on that statistic, you can choose to run OCR on it. Um, you can see the, the OCR is not perfect, but it's far better than the text that was extracted from that uh, PDF. All right, so now I'm going to talk about uh, why uh, this matters uh, and talk about um, why we've uh, added Tika pipes. So thank you, Nick Birch, for uh, crashing JVMs at scale. So there are the usual, you know, catch the exceptions kinds of things. The parser had a, wasn't very happy with things, but then there are also the more catastrophic things like out of memory errors, infinite loops, memory leaks, um, malicious code, runaway forked processes, all of those wonderful things that can happen with parsers. And I used to feel awful about this, but then I realized that Tika really isn't alone um, and that uh, Parsers generally, uh, software generally has vulnerabilities, but parsers in specific are extremely um, uh, prone to uh, uh, security issues, uh, uh, whether that's denial of service or um, uh, remote code execution or other fun things. Kathleen Fisher recently had a great keynote where she was talking about how dangerous parsing can be. Um, these stats are from her talk. Um, parsers are dangerous, uh, in, especially when you're running untrusted parsers on untrusted uh, inputs, bad things can happen. Um, font, font parsers, um, four of the CVEs mentioned in this um, ex exploit chain are font parsers. Uh, so I found that rather amusing. Anyways, parsing is dangerous. Uh, this also came up recently. A rogue document might bring the process to a halt. Um, that should never happen to you. Uh, if it does, um, we should talk. Uh, and, you know, with Antique, we have had these problems. We have had um, infinite loops and, and other issues, which we try to fix as we can. But it's it, it really is a systemic issue. And are infinite loops really that bad? Yes, they are. They really, really are uh, for your CPUs, for the environment, um, for everything. They really do run for a long, long time. Some might say infinitely. All right. Um, so in Tika, we, we, until we get uh, verified secure parsers, uh, which aren't on the horizon in the near term, we're trying to mitigate <laughs> catastrophes as we can. Um, we're doing all sorts of things, uh, code reviews. Uh, we're having, we have a file format or fuzzy module, which we just started. We have two terabytes of regression corpora. We have a mock parser, uh, which allows you to try out uh, what would happen if a misbehaving parser misbehaved for you. Um, so here you, you um, add uh, the Tika core test jar to your class path, and then you can send an XML file with a mock element in it. And you can have the parser do things like throw an OOM or do a system exit, um, which can be quite exciting. Uh, so to run Tika safely, we have the fork parser, which forks uh, uh, the parsing into another process, Tika batch, which does the same thing pretty much in a different way. Tika server, I'll talk about in detail. And now in 2x, we have pipes and async, um, which both uh, use forked processes to do the, the hard, uh, the, the, the risky part of, of the parsing. 
our overall goal is to be boring. We want to be so boring that um, I can stop giving talks on Tika and it just works. Uh, there are obviously will always be um, problems. Uh, there will be uh, out of memory errors, there'll be infinite loops, but Tika should be able to, to control those uh, by itself. All right, so evolution of Tika server. Is Tika server safe? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, so in the beginning, uh, you had a Tika, you had a client calling Tika, uh, and when it went out uh, with a crash, uh, it went. There's nothing there to restart it. Uh, people around the world had to restart their own uh, Tika servers. We added spawn child, which would become default in Tika 2x, which means that um, a, a, a watcher process starts the server. Uh, when the client sends a file, it causes a problem. Uh, Tika can crash, but the um, the watcher will restart the process. It will also look for timeouts, um, uh, out of memory errors, and and, uh, and crashes. So. Um, yeah, so that, that's where we, that will now become default in, in Tika 2x. We've had the spawn child mode in Tika 1x for a while. All right, so the Tika pipes module looks to solve a lot of these uh, problems and make, um, make, make things much more uh, robust, scalable, and uh, safe. The key thing is to isolate uh, parsing into its own process. Uh, we want to keep the iterator and the command module, the client, separate from uh, the process that's uh, doing the parsing. Um, we want to allow for, uh, for robust time in, timeouts, and we also want to allow for really long parse times. So, so let's say you want to run OCR on a 100-page PDF. You're not going to send that to Tika server because currently you have to keep the um, HTTP connection open uh, to get the response back. So fetchers and emitters. Uh, the notion here is that you fetch data from someplace, do some processing, and then emit the output. Uh, fetcher looks like this. Uh, here's a file system fetcher. It has a name and it has a path to where it should pull um, files from. Uh, this is kind of the output. Uh, this is all recursive metadata parser output where you get the metadata and then the content is stuck in the um, XT content uh, key. Uh, we have metadata filters started in 1x, uh, so you can say uh, from what comes out of Tika, I want you to map that file name, that um, metadata name to something else. And we have emitters, so it says the first emitter is a Solar 1 emitter and it sends something off to Solar, or you can uh, configure a, a file system emitter, which will send the output to the file system. This is what you send to Tika to say, here's my fetcher, here's my emitter, here's the key that I want to use to fetch the file, here's my key that I want to emit the file. You can uh, inject your own user metadata and you can tell it what to do on a parse exception. Uh, these, this, all of this stuff works with Tika server with pipes and async. Pipes is you send something and get a response back. Async is you just send a bunch of responses uh, and hope everything works out okay. Okay, so the current state uh, from a scalability standpoint is a client, um, let's say, goes to S3, grabs a bunch of bytes, sends those to Tika, gets the text back, and sends those to Solar. Scaling wise, this is horrible because um, the client is sloshing all these bytes all over the place, um, bad for the data center. Um, in the fetch emitter uh, idea, uh, the uh, client sends a JSON uh, fetching the tuple to Tika, which sends that JSON to a separate JVM, uh, which does which pulls the bytes out of S3, does the parsing, and then sends those off to Solar. So when bad things happen, um, it will, will it will restart that JVM and and Tika will be good to go. And also, you can have mul obviously multiple uh, worker JVMs uh, going at the same time, so that you can send a bunch of uh, requests, and all of those will work in parallel. All right. Um, and the great thing is that then you can scale this across a cluster easily because the client's no longer pulling in all the bytes from a data source and then sending all those bytes across the cluster. You're just sending JSON, and then Tika is, is pulling the appropriate um, bytes, doing the processing, and then forwarding those to uh, to an endpoint or emitting those to an endpoint. Then we also have the notion of a uh, fetch iterator, which just kind of automates this. So this is a file system um, pipes iterator, which um, will iterate through files in a, in a file share. It will use the fetcher uh, as specified, and it will also use the emitter. So here's an example of configuring a little bit of uh, XML to say, go to this directory, um, pull all of these files, and send them off to Solar. Next step, uh, we need more tests and documentation. More tests and documentation, um, especially with uh, Dockerized mocked S3 Solar. We're going to add OpenSearch uh, and hopefully Vespa fairly shortly. We also need to figure out a way to package jars for Tika Server. All right. So in general, I think I ran through that at uh, twice the speed. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but off we go. So please join the fun. Uh, here are some links, um, and off we go to questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I think this leaves uh, quite some time for questions. So please don't be shy, type in your questions uh, into the chat next to the, um, to the stage. 
Uh, my question, Tim, would be, uh, let's say uh, I run an enterprise search and I've used Tika for parsing documents uh, so far. So what would be what would the, the migration path look like? Yeah, so uh, I, I understand that I have to look at all the modules that are available now. Yep. Um, would this be the path or how would you approach it? Sure. So it, it, at, the, at the very least, you can pretty much drop in a Tika server standard for the old Tika server uh, with the one caveat that you will no longer have the, um, the science parser modules and the SQLite 3 in, with it. So you have to add those manually. But the Tika uh, server um, uh, standard should, should, be, should act the same. Um, there are some differences. For those who want to move into the pipes mode, though, um, that's where you'll have to see if you know if, if we have a fetcher that meets your needs. Um, we currently cover S3 uh, local file share. Uh, we want to add some other uh, fetchers, and if there's an endpoint uh, in emitter that covers your needs, and if that's the case, then uh, you can start experimenting with uh, scaling that out, uh, making sure that it works in your environment uh, and is performant. Uh, I would encourage everybody to use the mock parser in uh, on your dev system uh, to see what happens when a parser uh, calls a system exit, um, which most parsers shouldn't. We did have one that did at one point, um, but that helps uh, imitate what can happen with um, uh, when an OOM killer on the operating system decides that uh, a parser is doing something horrible for the <laughs> for the um, survival of the OS. So those are. The, that the, the, it, in in short, that's how how, how I would proceed with with upgrading. Okay, uh, so now there are a few questions uh, in the chat. So the first one: uh, Does Tika two point also modularize the mime type detection or just the extraction and parsing? Uh, it does. Um, it's we don't have a clear a clean way of doing it. Um, but yes, so if you are using the sub sub module, so if you only want the Tika Microsoft Office parsers, for example, um, or if you let's say you only want the PDF parser, but you want to be able to detect, detect whether it's a PowerPoint or an XLSX file, um, you would then need to add, you would, you, if you're not using the Tika standard stuff, which most people should, um, but you're using those little sub modules, you would have to include the Tika Microsoft parsers module because that's what is now doing the detection for the subtype detection of Office files. Um, so it is modularized. It's not as neat as we would like um, because we want to have a lot of the stuff uh, Available in Tika Core uh, for at least the um, my magic detection, which just looks at the first couple of uh, first thousand bytes of a file. Um, but yes, we have uh, we we have tried to um, uh, to modularize uh, detection as we can. Okay, Again, great. Sorry for people using standard uh, Tika standard. Um, you you won't notice any differences. Okay, that sounds cool. Next question is: um, Are you seeing parsers for any of the cloud provider documents being created? So uh, like Google Docs uh, on Google Drive? No, uh, we, I haven't. Um, the, the closest that comes to that is Nicholas De Piazza, who I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, recently opened a ticket for um, Microsoft Exchange 365 uh, um, uh, OneNote files, uh, because apparently the 365 uh, OneNotes are different from the regular OneNotes. Um, but no, I haven't seen folks uh, contributing parsers or even heard of the need yet for those um, file formats. Uh, but uh, committers are standing by. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, if I look at the Google Drive search, maybe there's a place for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so next question is, uh, will Tika 2 be a drop-in replacement for users of Solar who use the Tika integration? <sighs> yes. <laughs> it should be, yeah. Um, for yes, it, it it absolutely should be. Uh, again, with the, I'm pretty sure you're not bringing in the SQLite dependency, so you're not going to lose that. Um, and again, this the same thing applies with the, with the science uh, scientific parsers. Uh, but it, it should be much cleaner because the Tika standard is not pulling in um, uh, HTTP components and other things that it used to clash with Solar. Uh, I would still encourage you not to uh, uh, parse files in the same JVM that Solar's running in. Uh, that's just a recipe for disaster, no matter what Eric Pugh will tell you. <laughs> yeah, that's so well sell. OK. OK, uh, next question then, maybe somehow related. Uh, for ar archival data, what are the pros and cons of parsing once and storing the parsed data versus reparsing when it re-indexing? <sighs> 
I recommend something that I've never seen happen in practice. Um, I, I recommend reparsing uh, and perhaps using the Tika eval out of vocabulary stuff to figure out if you're doing a better job or a worse job. Um, as our parsers get better, we are pulling out more text. We're pulling out uh, more reliable text. And we again, we measure reliability with um, that out of vocabulary statistic. So we know that we are getting better on most files. There's always the chance when you move, especially with PDFs, um, that as you improve generally, that you still might have regressions on a file here or there. So from an archival standpoint, I would want to be very careful about throwing out old parses where you might have had good good text that you're not getting now. Um, yeah. So look into Tika eval and and keep keep refreshing uh, those parses as as you deem uh, valuable uh, to your need and um, if you have the budget to do it.